Well, welcome and good afternoon. Welcome to this press conference. Welcome here in the room and on the live stream. And a special welcome to my wonderful panelists here. Um, the topic we're dedicating this press conference to is uh, the topic of cybercrime. Um, for those of you who've been here last year, have been watching the press conferences last year, you'll remember um, we've been talking about this, this uh, topic last year. And in fact, the World Economic Forum has started um, working on cybercrime in 2015. And the purpose of this press conference here today is to give you an update on where we stand, what we've learned, and what we believe, or uh, the panelists here believe the next steps are. Uh, let me quickly introduce uh, the panelists to you. To my immediate left, uh, I'm joined by Jean-Luc Vey, who's the Head of Public Security Policy and Security <coughs> Affairs at the World Economic Forum and also a member of its Executive Committee. Uh, next to him, we're joined by Noburu Nakatani. He's the Executive Director of Interpol Global Complex for Innovation, uh, based in Singapore. And right at the heart of our panel, we are joined by Michelle Konings. She is the President of Eurojust in Den Haag. And last but definitely not least, we're joined by Andre Kudelski, who's the Chairman of the Board and the CEO of Kudelski Group here in Switzerland. Um, Thank you very much for being here. Without further ado, Jean-Luc, I pass on to you. Um, we launched the recommendations for public-private partnership in cybercrime to fight cybercrime last year. Um, what's the update? Where do we stand today? Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, last year, uh, during the annual meeting 2016, top uh, executives from our uh, partners, from the forum partners, and the uh, top representatives from the law enforcement agencies acting on the global level, regional level, and national level, uh, decided uh, to enhance, to increase the efficiency, the common efficiency against the fight, uh, um, in the fight against the cybercrime. So they launched uh, five recommendations, the purpose of which, uh, the main purpose of which, was to uh, uh, increase the collaboration between the private sector and the public one by furthering, namely, the creation of information sharing platforms. Uh, during the year 2016, uh, the recommendations one and two have uh, begun to be uh, implemented. Mr. Nakatani will inform you uh, on uh, what has been achieved on the global level at the Interpol. And Michelle Konings, uh, who is the, to a certain extent the first prosecutor of the European Union, will inform you on uh, what has been achieved on that field on the regional European uh, Union. Based on those recommendations, uh, the community composed by high representative from the private sector and uh, high representative from the law enforcement decided to go ahead and to uh, implement on a practical way the recommendation one and two. So they have elaborated during the year 2016 guidance, guidance on public-private information sharing against cybercrime, the purpose of which is to help the partners, private sector and law enforcement, to exactly know what has to be shared within these information sharing platforms and how should the information be shared. So you understand the idea was not and is not only to set up information sharing platform, to participate, to further the participation to information sharing platform, but also, and it is important, to help the participants to uh, practically work together. A couple of elements regar regarding uh, these guidance. This guidance is uh, driven by a couple of principles. Regarding the what, uh, four principles have been listed. Share, first principle, share all information not limited by legal constraints. Try to share. 
try to share. It is important. It is good in order to fight, effectively fight the cybercrime. Second principle, information sharing should be a two-way street, or let's say a two-highway street. If only the private sector is sharing, it doesn't bring anything. Is the uh, law enforcement are alone by the sharing, it doesn't bring anything. So two-way street sharing. Third principle, no sharing of information without checking applicable legal framework, especially important with regard to the sharing of personal data. And fourth, better to share process data than raw data, because by sharing process data, you help the partner to better understand what you are saying, what kind of information you are sharing. Uh, said otherwise, it helps, this principle helps the partner to speak the same language. Regarding the how, the other aspect covered by these guidance, uh, three principles uh, have driven the guidance. First, real-time information, that means 24-7 information capacity. Cybercrime is going very fast ahead. If the partners who are ready to share are not able to build this capacity to share on real time, it won't br bring anything. Second, use secure channels, very important as well. All the questions around the encryption have to be discussed in, in that field, of course, but secure channels have to be set up. And third, know your counterpart. As uh, several uh, private sectors have uh, uh, done so far, especially the banking sector, uh, which is led since many years by the principle know your customer, the idea here is to help the partners to better know each other it is important that the chief information security officer, when something is happening in the business, knows with who is the counterpart by the law enforcement, who is the prosecutor uh, he has to uh, uh, ask in order to get his support. So you see, we decided together with our partners to really go ahead based on a very practical approach of the uh, fight against the cyber crime. Thank you very much. And the good news is that you don't have to hack our website to get these documents that Jean-Luc so uh, teasingly waved at you earlier. Uh, you'll find them uh, freely available there. Um, without further ado, Nakatani-san, um, Jean-Luc uh, breezed over it already. You're clearly representing the, the global perspective here. Please share with us uh, your perspective there. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Uh, first of all, um, it's a great pleasure for me to participate in the annual meeting of uh, Davos World Economic Forum, uh, especially the project of a public-private partnership against cybercrime under the leadership of Mr. Bates. Thank you so much. Uh, from an Interpol perspective, this is very important, as because most of the cyber threat and the evidence law enforcement need to prevent investigate cyber crimes rest with the uh, private sector. So actually, we need to change the mindset on the both uh, public and private sector, from need to know to need to share. So need to share mindset, that's very important. Um, in that context, we really appreciate World Economic Forum as a global platform that enable us, law enforcement, easily to interact with world-renowned companies as well as global leaders to discuss cybercrime, which is clearly disrupting world economy, as well as the public safety and uh, uh, security. Uh, regarding tw uh, 2016, the recommendations, uh, Interpol is committed to facilitating information sharing uh, between the public sector, especially law enforcement, and the private, uh, 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 private sector. In fact, as a collaboration with uh, private sector and academia, leveraging their technologies, expertise, is at the heart of the Interpol strategy to combat cybercrime. Our Interpol Global Complex for Innovation in Singapore, we call it IGCI, uh, for which I'm responsible, is designed to be one-stop shop to assist our member country to combat cybercrime. And actually, it has several experts from different uh, private companies 
working together with Interpol staff side by side and then providing operational assistance to our member countries in uh, investigating cybercrime. And this effort has already delivered result, contributing to member countries' successful cybercrime investigation. For instance, business email compromise, I believe you know that, uh, in Nigeria last summer. This is just one example. And this collaboration has been already extended to the digital forensic field uh, by leveraging expertise of the private companies expert uh, to support our member countries' digital forensic activities on the field, in the field. So we deploy the teams to our member countries upon their request. In, with regard to the 2017 guidance, uh, Interpol has actually just shared its lesson learned and the best practices coming from the, our daily activities uh, during the series of sessions to discuss this guidance. I think this guidance is clearly one big step forward to respond to new digital economy where the technology goes faster than <laughs> policy and the legislative framework. So currently, company, not country, define certain set of rules which we follow. Say, encryption. It's not country. And law enforcement cannot compel tech companies to decrypt. This is not the starting point of finding solutions in this matter. So what is important, at least in the global context, is to discuss what could be done legally and technologically, rather than what should be done. That is more or less uh, discussed at national, in the national context. Having said that, it is very much fundamentally important for law enforcement to learn the principles of the information sharing with private sector, especially cross-border information sharing. Moving forward, 2017, uh, we will make outreach effort to our membership, 190 member countries, on the introduction and the practical application of this guidance through our activities. This effort may include awareness raising to the Chief of Police or Minister, Ministry of uh, Interior and the capacity building activities that are designed to help law enforcement especially in developing countries, uh, to understand and establish the most appropriate process to elicit information and to collaborate with private companies in fighting cybercrime. And last but not least, I'm happy to share in this context that Interpol has a great pleasure to co-host the forum cybercrime, the workshop, actually the, the session which we had today, at the Interpol Global Complex for Innovation in Singapore this July in order to further promote practical way of implementing the 2016 recommendation based on the newly uh, developed uh, uh, guidance, which you can uh, see in the, uh, on, on the online. So this is a uh, brief update in 2016 recommendation as well as uh, newly developed guidance, uh, guidance. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Michelle. Let's move to the European perspective. Um, what are your What are your thoughts on this? Well, thanks a lot. Let's move uh, to um, the uh, view of um, uh, the justice uh, and look at the issue from um, uh, in EU perspective and with, uh, I would say, a judicial magnifying glass or with uh, judicial eyes. Uh, without any doubt, uh, the um, seriousness, uh, uh, the complexity and the pace with which uh, the uh, cyber criminals are acting and the cyber threat is posed uh, is of an unprecedented level. We have never seen this uh, and it's evolving every single year more and more. And hence uh, we need to respond uh, uh, to a common need, a common threat uh, in a common way. And so far we were used that the corporate security uh, was only talking about cyber security. Let's disrupt uh, cyber um, uh, attacks. Let's uh, have uh, uh, take down of uh, cyber hackers. Uh, let's uh, focus on uh, reducing the impact of a cyber attack and let's uh, focus on business, uh, uh, business continuity. Good 
not good enough. And from the side of the public sector, uh, we uh, used to work uh, with uh, not only um, uh, criminal activity, but also with evidence, this time e-evidence. Uh, not only stopping criminal activity, but also having to stop criminals with this a little bit different. Uh, and we saw that working in silos, focusing on cyber security only, on cyber justice on the other side, uh, working in silos was not giving the right response. So the answer is definitely uh, what the WEF has been promoting under the leadership of Dr. Jean-Luc Vesse uh, is bringing the partners together, working in a triple P fashion, public, private, partnership uh, with the recommendations and the guidance. Joining the forces uh, and uh, joining the knowledge, uh, changing the attitude and behavior, and hence changing the culture. Have we been successful in that sense in the European Union? Initiatives have been taken at EU level, from the police uh, side and from the justice side. Uh, the European Cybercrime Centre has been established some years ago and is deeply involved uh, in exchange of information and the stepping up of the context with the private sector. And we from the justice side at Eurojust have made a bridge between the EC3 and the JCAT uh, uh, platform and a newly established um, network of European judicial specialists, cybercrime prosecutors from the 28 countries designated because of their skills and knowledge and ability. And that together has been leading to more successes. Uh, and if you go on our websites, Europol and Eurojust will show you examples uh, like the Avalanche operation, which was operated in November, never seen before, such a serious, Hacking, globally organized, uh, lasted for years and years. Uh, and because we so far only focus on the takedown of the criminal infrastructure, we stopped criminal activity, but we didn't stop the criminals. Hence, we joined the forces uh, and they do this throughout coordination meetings, meeting with prosecutors and policemen from 30 countries we're not used to work with. Uh, and we were using legal remedies which we were not used to work with in the national context. Uh, and that is what we have been doing with success. Five persons were uh, arrested, never happened before. New systems have been used based on new legal initiatives uh, and on inventivity, creativity of prosecutors of 30 countries. Uh, the thing that is against us is time. We all know that the classic MLA, Mutual Legal Assistant, International Judicial Cooperation, is too lengthy. And that is where the combat, the fight becomes asymmetric. Criminals are sophisticated, creative, and inventive, and we lose time. The only way forward uh, is to step up the cooperation with the private sector, with the CSPs, the ISPs, the ESPs, uh, with working more closely with the private sector, be it the banking uh, sector, as we have been doing in the EMMA actions one and two last year, where we managed uh, to work with the European Federation of Banks and where we <laughs> had the information in real time, allowing us uh, to go after a lot of persons being arrested. What I also try to say is that networking is needed to beat networks, and these cybercrime networks help uh, to gather the good practices, the bad experiences, the lessons learned, uh, and this is something we are capturing also in the convictions monitor at Eurojust uh, and spreading the good news and also the bad news in order to ensure punity not allow ourselves to fail because we are the voice of the victims. We are there in a state of a rule of law to ensure correct responses uh, in stopping not only criminal activity, but also the criminals. Are we there yet? Not at all. We will focus in the next years on the Convention of Budapest. Uh, it's not having a white adherence. We should look at the widening of the adherence and a lot of legal and practical challenges ahead. Encryption, anonymization, uh, 
access to e uh, evidence uh, or, or a short uh, list uh, of problems we will have to face. We have to build up the knowledge and build up the trust. In other terms, besides the triple P, public-private partnership, we also have to th thrive and think about the triple T. Time, trust, and thinking out of the box. Um, and that's what we're going to do all together. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. So whatever doubts might have been discussed in, in recent weeks about globalization, clearly cybercrime is a global ph phenomenon. And thank you for sharing the sense of urgency and the need for speed here with us. Uh, Andre, I'll, I'll make you work twice as hard as the other panelists, because not only are you the representative for the private sector here, but you also represent a company that works in the field. So uh, please share your perspective with us. Thank you. I would just start by saying we are speaking here about the moving target because we are not in a static situation. We have at the same time the digitalization that is coming at a very high speed. So fundamentally, more and more functions are now digital. So said in a different way, we are coming from a small shop to a supermarket. And in a supermarket, you have more to be stolen than a small shop. So fundamentally, for the pirates, you have real opportunities. Having said that, the first ones that have been able to really take advantage of the internet are the pirates. Why? Because they are by definition not regulated. So fundamentally, they have not the same limits that the uh, normal actor have. Now we can ask ourselves, but why security is so important? So some people may think is to avoid to have money stolen. But at the same time, you have some data or some information that are even much more valuable than just money. Because money, I would say money can buy money, but fundamentally, you have some elements that money cannot buy. Like, for example, if you have some personal data for personalized medicine, knowing that in the future, to be able to better treat person will need to have more and more personal data. And these data need absolutely to be protected. And if they are not protected well, or it is creating a big risk for the person in terms of privacy, or this treatment will just not happen. Now, we can ask ourselves, but why private sector cannot act alone, or public sector cannot act alone? And there is a fundamental difference between the two sectors and the real complementarity. If I'm looking at first state actors, they lack sometimes some flexibility due to their own rules, but they have also, and that is, I think, the most important limit, they have a limited territory they can work on. On the other side, private sector, I'm not saying that all companies are flexible, but they can be potentially flexible, they can be global, but on the other side, they have a lack of legitimacy. So fundamentally, they may have good idea, they may see the right thing, but on the other side, they will not have the right to do what is needed. Then we have this need to have a dynamic combination between the two. Because as it was just said before, we are living in an asymmetrical world. Said in a different way, if you want to have something that is secure, you need to have it 100% secure. If you have someone that is interested to hack an information or to make an exploit for a cyber attack, he needs to be successful once per 1,000 per 1 million. Let's imagine that you have 1 million wallets with $10,000. You need to be successful once per million or two times per million to still get something that is interesting. So just to say that the rules are done in such a way that the pirates have much less to achieve to be successful than the guardian. And in such a situation, we just need to have solutions that are at internet speed and not in the old day speed. I would say it's not slow food. So fundamentally, what we need is the capability to act much faster than if we use the traditional way. And that is requiring a real-time communication between the different actors. And for that, a combination 
between public and private is really optimum because we can at the same time get the flexibility of some goods, uh, how to say, private actors that are maybe better than others, and on the other side, to get all the legitimacy and the backbone that do that what is done is better than what the pirate or the bad guys are doing. And that is really a fundamental way to be able to address that. But what is interesting, I think that this is one of the first examples where we can use the private-public partnership to be able to act faster in sectors that are fast moving, and I'm not sure that it will be the only one where such new technique will be implemented. So it's a real opportunity to be able to be more performing. Now, I'll just give you a few examples of elements that we as a company have already done in this field a few years ago. Fundamentally, to be able to uh, trace and to be able to arrest some pirates that were operating cross-boundary when most of our clients were just active in one country, we have seen that without a collaboration between the private and public sector, that would not have been possible. And we see that in terms of public partner, uh, public um, private partnership, not all countries are equal. Some countries have been much faster in using such, uh, such type of approach, and some have been more reluctant. But if we look at the results, the countries that have been much more receptive for such type of uh, partnership have been far better in addressing all type of piracy. I'm not only speaking about cyber piracy, but all other different forms. So finally, just as a short conclusion, is to say that we are living in a very fast-moving digital world, and we cannot use the old recipe to address the new threat, and we need to be creative, but at the same time to respect some rule of law, and here the role of the state is absolutely essential. Thank you very much. Um, Jean-Luc, I know that the professionals like we have on the panel here are usually reluctant to share like concrete cases. Um, I'll put you on the spot anyways, um, because you're on camera and you can't run away. Um, can you share some examples uh, that we have uh, from the work since 2015? Well, I, I think, I think the, the essential has been, has been said and, and the, the, main, the main challenge that the actors uh, are, are facing is really the speed. And, and uh, what all actors said and all are agreed on, on, on that is the fact that, that uh, the usual normal uh, uh, forms of, of collaboration and the usual normal form of uh, 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 transformation of legislations are not efficient anymore. So there is a huge need for a innovative regulation regulation forms and it is exactly what what we have tried to to do since since uh, since two years and uh, especially since the the launch of the recommendation find new innovative clever uh, forms of uh, regulations and uh, it is especially uh, remarkable by the guidance the philosophy behind the guidance the purpose of which, again, is to help the partners to know what is to share and how are the information to be shared, was really to, uh, and is still, uh, to address the fields of information which can be shared without to address very complicated legal aspects linked, for example, with international conventions, linked with the mutual legal assistance treaties, or existing uh, 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 legislation regarding the personal data. And, and it was the main philosophy, is remaining the main philosophy. And what was interesting to, to see is that all actors working on, on this project had to admit, had to admit that this field is is bigger than, than, than thought. And uh, just to, to give you a couple of examples, uh, indicators of compromises can be, can be shared, like unusual networked activity, login failures, 
uh, modus operandi, tools, technique, procedures, lessons learned, and so on. A lot of things which can really be shared without to ask too many questions around the legal aspect. And in, in, in a, uh, said otherwise, uh, the, the main principle and philosophy behind that is share everything, everything which is not forbidden to share, legally forbidden to share. And it is a, 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 a transformation of the mindset, you know, and I have the impression it is, it is feasible. It is feasible, and uh, uh, so my assessment is that <laughs> the recommendation and the, the guidance uh, have enabled the, 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 the to create uh, to create on the on the global level, but also on the regional level, as as Michel mentioned, uh, a momentum. And if everybody is uh, going ahead with this mindset, uh, I think a uh, the cyber criminals, uh, which uh, are supposed are supposed to be to be caught, uh, uh, will will fear both the private sector and the, the law enforcement. Thank you very much. Um, exactly. Let's open the floor for, for questions. I uh, see a hand raised here. We have a microphone. If you could state your name and organization, also for the sake of our online audience, please. Angela Charlton from the Associated Press. I have a question about a particular kind of cyber crime. Uh, the U.S. has accused Russian hackers of meddling in the U.S. election campaign. The Russian government has also accused unspecified hackers in the West, possibly the U.S., of doing the same in Russia. How can you stop that kind of cyber crime? And relatedly to that, Europe is having elections this year. There are concerns among European governments that the same thing will happen here. Do you see any signs of hacking by Russia or other actors? And are you doing, what are you doing to prevent that? Thank you very much. Um, do we have any okay. volunteers on the panel to take their question? I, I, I can? Okay. Please. W w when it comes to the cyber threat or the cyber, uh, cyber attack, the people in different countries have a different understanding of the same word. So actually Interpol practically categorizes it, a cyber attack, uh, into four categories based on the actors involved. One is a cyber criminals, they just work for money. And the second is hacktivists. They don't work for money, but they just work uh, for their uh, purpose, own purpose, maybe protest, or those kinds of things. Third is a terrorist. They are using uh, uh, internet to attack certain other uh, target. The fourth is a nation state, which is involved in the cyber espionage. And then, having said that, Actually, the, the, for instance, Interpol, International Criminal Police Organization. So we are working in the boundary of the criminal justice. There is something related to the cyber attack, especially the fourth category, is, is not something that can be solved in the framework of the criminal justice. Perhaps that might be outside of criminal justice, maybe in the diplomacy, politics, those kind of things. So I think it, depending on the nature of the cyber attack, and then the procedure, or, or I would say, the way we could solve would be different. So this is uh, my answer to your question. Thank you very much. You want to add to that, please? Yes, it is a very important question, your, your question. Um, at the World Economic Forum, and, and uh, together with uh, our constituents, uh, representative from several private sectors and, and law enforcement, we uh, discuss uh, those kind of questions two years ago, and it has been decided to address only the fields where all actors do have the same interests, which is the case by the fight against cyber crime, which is obviously not the case as soon as cyber is used as tool of war, or propaganda, or you can, you can call that <laughs> a, a, as, you, as you want. And and uh, we we are <laughs> convinced that by doing so, we will achieve results. And uh, I have the impression <laughs> that those results have been achieved, but n not not only because <laughs> the actors represented were very good ones and professionals, but because the actors uh, had common s common interest and were therefore able to find common measures, because they have the same interests. You understand what I mean? Please, Andre, if you want to add to that. 
I would just take this issue from a completely different angle. Very often some people may ask, but what are the consequences of cyber attacks? And I think that what have happened recently is crystal clear making us aware that cyber security is something that is really important. And at the end, I would say that there are some doubts about who can do something and cannot do something, but it clearly shows that there is a need to improve the level of uh, uh, resilience against cyber attacks and better traceability. So that is for me, that are the two main lessons learned here, rather than to try to guess who is doing what. Please, uh, could you wait for the microphone, please? <coughs> America are members of Interpol, so if they're doing this, there's essentially nothing that you can do to stop this kind of what you call cyber war. That's basically another field entirely, and even all of the expertise and knowledge you have can't be applied in any way to this kind of situation. So that's uh, the focus of this initiative is indeed cybercrime, that is correct. We have time for one more question, maybe. Um, if I can see a show of hands. Yes, we have the, the lady in the back. The microphone is coming. Thank you. Uh, Farah Bushvak from Frost24. Um, we've seen the rise in biometrics um, at the borders, in uh, payment methods. How worried are you uh, with the spread of biometrics and uh, how can we ensure data privacy? Andre, would that be a question for you? That may be a question for me. And <laughs> so the question is first, what are the possibility and the second element is how it's done. Now, <coughs> if I imagine that done in a classical way, then yes, there is a risk because you have some element of fingerprinting that are collected and stored in a database. Now, if I'm taking the next step where the goal is not to collect but to check is to have system where you get some signature in a way that you have never the information that is as in clear, but that is stored in a way that it cannot be used, just to check if it's match or don't match. But I don't think that we are at this state now, so I would say that that is one of the elements where we really need to be extremely careful, because once more, if there is a doubt, the doubt can create some confusion. Thank you very much. Um, mindful of the advanced time, I'm closing this press conference. Thank you for watching, thank you for being here, and a special thank you to all our panelists today. Thank you very much. <laughs>